Hi boys and girls. I wanted to keep reading our Wharton and the King of the Skies book with you. Now I know some of you like Damien, Aria, Melody, I think I have to catch you up. But we started a new read aloud last week and it is called Wharton and the King of the Skies. It's about two toads, Wharton and Morton. They are brothers and they're a little bit different from each other. Wharton likes to clean whereas Morton really loves cooking. Um, anyway, it's taking place in the forest. The two toads live underground, um, underneath a big spruce tree, which is a, an evergreen tree, a tree with needles. And they live in a forest during the summer. It's a very hot day. It, it had been a streak of hot weather. And Wharton decides he wants to do something thoughtful for his brother, Morton. So he builds him... Um, kind of a makeshift hot air balloon. I don't know if you can see the picture here. The bottom's made out of a um, their, their wooden bathtub, and the way they get it to float is they use um, snakeskin tubes, uh, which we kind of thought was uh, a little bit weird. But anyway, it worked. They went flying. Uh, Morton tried it out first. He was very nervous about doing it. He seems like more of the careful of the brothers, but he didn't want to hurt his uh, brother's feelings. So he did get in the um, balloon and he went, right, it was tied with a string to a tree stump. Um, well, then he wanted Morton to try it because he thought it was so neat. So what he did is he had Morton, or I'm um, sorry, he had Morton <laughs> get into the balloon. And unfortunately, um, a gust of breeze kind of filled the snake, soon to, snake skin tubes and the balloon started to kind of float right away. Well, here, it was so strong, it was tied to a little um, a branch on the tree stump. Well, here, the branch broke off and Wharton went flying. Well, Morton grabs onto the rope, trying to pull him down. Well, we know toads, they're too light. So now here, Wharton and Morton now are flying away. Well, sadly, they end up, and you can see in the picture again, the front picture, uh, the cover tells it a lot. Um, he, right here you have a, um, a cliff, and they did end up banging into it. Luckily, they weren't hurt, but their uh, little aircraft was ruined. Um, not only that, but they're also in the middle of the forest where they don't know their way back. Um, they do come up with a good idea that they, one of them had remembered seeing a stream, so they're going to follow the stream back. So they decide to, uh, they have to fix up the aircraft. They're not going to try to fly it again. Rather, they're going to try to make it into a boat. Um, and that's kind of where we left off. What I'm going to do is go back maybe a half a page or so of what we read on Thursday to kind of catch you up. I'll try not to leave you hanging either. One thing that you need to know if you weren't here, if the chapters are a little bit long, so um, I may stop partway through. Here we go. Morton's voice carried to him loud and clear. Run, Morton, run! Instantly, Morton jumped up. He leaped up onto the bank and saw two animals slinking towards Morton. At first, they looked like harmless squirrels, but Morton quickly realized that these creatures were far from harmless. The low-slung bodies with the rich brown fur on their backs and the pure white fur on their bellies, the short, powerful legs, the pointed teeth, and the shiny dark eyes meant only one thing. These were the most bloodthirsty and ferocious animals of the whole forest. Weasels! cried Wharton. Get him! commanded a sharp voice. Wharton spun around and saw two more weasels. They crept slowly towards him. Their tails were straight out, the muscles in their strong legs were tight, and their black eyes were shining. Wharton tried to get to Morton's side, but as soon as he took one step, the weasel farthest away moved, and with lightning, spirit, uh, lightning speed appeared directly in front of him. Face to face with the ferocious creature, Wharton felt a chill run through him. He noticed the drops of dried blood that stained the weasel's pointy chin. Wharton could see no way of escape. Then the weasel flicked his tail. Wharton squeezed his eyes shut and waited for him to pounce. 
Follow me, commanded the weasel. Wharton was stunned. He blinked and then looked over at Morton, noticing with relief that he too was still all right. Well, snarled the plumpest weasel, whose belly nearly touched the ground. You heard what Fulton said. Let's go. Wharton had no more time to wonder what was happening. He followed along behind the fat weasel while Morton fell behind one of the others. They walked beside the grassy stream bank till they came to a lightly wooded area. The weasels made their way through the trees and around several boulders and stopped when they came to an overturned pine tree. Under its snarled and twisted roots, Wharton saw a dark hole. In there, said the fat weasel. Wharton entered, and feeling the solid earth under him, he knew it had taken many feet to pack it so hard. The hole went sharply downward, then turned and stopped before a flat stone. Wait, said the weasel, called Fulton. He put his weight against the stone and easily moved it aside. Wharton stepped through another smaller hole and found himself standing in a large room with a ceiling made of stone and walls that were part dirt and part wood. Pieces of pine tree roots poked out in several places. When Wharton looked at the floor, he shivered, for it was covered from wall to wall with furs. There were squirrel, rabbit, chipmunk, skunk, and many others. Quickly, he looked away, and then he noticed a long table that stood in the middle of the room. Four chairs were along each side and one at either end. As soon as they were all inside, Wharton turned towards the weasel called Fulton. Why have you brought us here, he asked us. He asked, excuse me, in a trembling voice. Without even looking at Wharton, Fulton strolled across the room. Tell him, Fritz, he called as he disappeared into one of two passageways. Fritz, the weasel with the big belly, was curling up in a corner of the room. I'm too tired, he yelled with a yawn. You tell him, Fred. I don't have to tell him anything, grumbled one of the weasels. You tell him, Floyd. And Fred started to walk away. I don't want to, said Floyd. It's too much bother. At that, Fred spun around and put his face directly in front of Floyd's. Everything's too much bother for you, he snarled. And he began clicking his sharp teeth at Floyd. That seemed to annoy Floyd very much, and he gave Fred a hard shove. Fred instantly shoved back, and the two fell to wrestling. They rolled over and over onto the floor, poking and snapping at each other, till they were both exhausted. Then they separated, and each lay down and shut his eyes. Can you imagine? They forgot all about Wharton and Morton. They got so caught up into fighting, and then they exhausted themselves and fell asleep. The weasels quickly fell asleep, and then Wharton realized no one was watching him and Morton. Morton, he whispered, this is our chance. We may be able to sneak out of here before they wake up. I was thinking the same thing, said Morton. They started for the hole that they had just come through. Uh-oh, said Wharton, they've rolled the stone back. The two toads ooh, pushed hard, but it was far too heavy for them to budge. We'd better look for another way out, said Morton. Quickly, they stole past the long table. At the other end of the room, they stood before two passageways. Wharton stepped into the first, and Morton followed. They saw a room on each side, and one at the end of the passageway. Peeking in the first room, they saw two weasels curled up and sleeping soundly. Cautiously, they went into the second room. Wharton was the first to look in. Oh, it's filled with garbage and junk, he whispered. No way out of here. The two toads hurried along the passageway till they came to the room at the end. They heard quite a bit of clattering and banging going on inside and someone singing in a very off-key voice. Wharton and Morton peered in from each side of the doorway. It's their kitchen, said Wharton with his eyes wide. Oh, it's horrible, gasped Morton, 
Remember, Morton's the one who likes to cook, so he's in the kitchen a lot. The counter was piled high with dirty pots and pans, and the sink overflowed with filthy dishes. There were stains on the ceiling, spots on the walls, and spills on the floor. A big stove was completely covered with bits of old food. It's the most disgusting kitchen I've ever seen, whispered Morton. Then a cupboard door slammed shut, and the two toads saw a weasel, about half the size of the other, standing before the counter. She was wearing a huge blue bow on her head, and as she filled a jar with peppercorns, she sang loudly in a hoarse voice. Oh, we'd better get away before she sees us, said Wharton. The sooner, the better, said Morton. I hope I never see such a sight again. Here's a picture. They hurried back to the big room and, finding the weasel still asleep, entered the other passageway. They saw only a single room along one side, but at the far end, they noticed the passageway turned a corner, and they headed there. Just as they reached the bend, they came face to face with Fulton. Looking for a way out, he laughed. Well, look all you want, because there's only one, the way you came in. Dejectedly, Wharton and Morton turned around and went back to the big room, with Fulton right behind them. The moment they entered the room, the weasel they had seen in the kitchen stepped out of the other passageway, carrying a large platter filled with buns. Supper's ready! She shouted at the top of her voice. Immediately, Floyd, Fred, and Fritz jumped to their feet. The two weasels who had been sleeping in the first room came dashing out. Two other weasels charged out of the second passageway. They shoved, pushed, and fell all over one another in their haste to get to the long table. When everyone was seated, the smaller weasel set the platter in the middle of the table alongside a pitcher filled with a rosy-colored liquid. Oh no, Frida, groaned one of the weasels. Oh, not rat burgers again. Frida gave him a steely-eyed look. If you don't like them, Felix, she snapped, you can do the cooking around here. Felix managed a small smile. I like them, he said meekly, and he reached for two of the rat burgers. And I believe I'd like some of your delicious rhubarb cider, too, he said, filling his mug from the pitcher. The other weasels jostled and jabbed and poked and punched as they grabbed for the burgers and the cider. The noise in the room was soon so loud, it made the pine roots sticking out of the walls actually quiver. All the weasels argued and talked at once. Then Fred and Fritz tried seeing who could sing the highest note. Floyd started a whistle, but his mouth was so full, oh, he sprayed bits of food all over Frida. Frida let out a shout and smacked him hard with a rat burger. All the while, Wharton and Morton watched in silence, shocked by the weasel's bad behavior. Then Fulton stood up on his chair and let out the ye loudest yell Wharton had ever heard. Shut up, everybody! He yelled five times before the room finally grew quieter. You all know it's my turn to be leader this week. Now listen to me. Oh, all right, said Felix. What is it? Well, said Fulton, glad to be getting some attention. Have you all noticed the toads Fritz, Fred, Floyd, and I captured today? All eyes turned towards Wharton and Morton standing in the middle of the room. So the other weasels, this is the first they even noticed. They had two toads. And we talked about this last week. Toads would be an animal that weasels would probably try to eat. I think I'm going to stop here because I don't want to leave you hanging. So stay tuned. Tomorrow I'll post another video where I'll continue reading. Just to let you know we're on page 50 right now. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. I hope you get a chance to go outside and enjoy the bright sunshine. See you soon.